my pleasure to introduce uh, Krista Wolf, I mean, who's no introduction, uh, CEO of SGN, um, founder and former CEO of MySpace. Um, I don't know what more I can say about him than you probably already know, so with that, I will happily turn it over to you guys. Um, it's a pleasure to see you here, Krista. I appreciate Thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Yukari Kane, and uh, I get to an ask him uh, questions today. Um, so, uh, you know, just to um, update us on what you've been doing, um, can you maybe begin by telling us what, uh, you know, you were, you were at MySpace, um, you learned a bunch of stuff from that experience, and now you're applying it at SGN. Uh, tell us about that. Yeah, so I started MySpace with uh, a couple other folks in late 2003, left in 2009. Had a lot of in, uh, inspiration, I would say, from um, my time at MySpace, what was going on in China in 2007 with all the farm games back then, before Farmville, and um, how people in the streets were spending their last dime on different farm products, which made it very clear to me that virtual goods were here to stay. And um, you know, same with my time in Japan when we had a joint venture in MySpace in Japan. Mm -hmm. In 2006, you know, 60% of the people in social networks were logging on through mobile devices and playing games. Mm -hmm. So those two things were clear. So we wanted to come up with a new model, which was a roll-up model. We knew people were going to be playing games on all platforms. So our basic thesis was that we were going to have a multi-platform game company that we were going to assemble by buying other companies and then organically um, filling in the gaps. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so today we're talking about removing the risk from building games and maximizing profits. And um, we, you and I have had conversations about you know, how, how um, it's all about balance. And um, so what... Uh, what is SGN's strategy in terms of um, you know, making sure that, that you get discovered and, and people kept, keep playing? Yeah, so our main thesis is we want to de-risk as much as possible the game development process. Um, it's so sad to see someone working on a game for a year and a half and have it be a great game, but it never sees the day of light. Yeah. So you know, from our perspective, we have a very, it starts in the very beginning when we choose the games that we develop. So we only develop two kinds of games, casual casino games and puzzle games with a great narrative around them. And what that means for us is two things. A, we have a lot of great tribal knowledge within our company in both of those genres so we can build great games. Mm -hmm. And two, we can cross promote one game to another. So instead of having to remarket every new game that we have, um, we can push people from one game to another. So that's one way we de-risk the sort of game development process. Secondly, we're super, super analytical in terms of the whole funnel when a user comes into the game. The first time user experience is so underrated. And I know, you know Apple and Steve Jobs have talked about it for a long time, but like, I'm not sure if we've talked about it enough in the game development space. Um, you know, we have a whole funnel analysis and, you know, for example, one of um, our newer games, we were doing some tests, and 40% of the people were dropping off at the first page, either because A, it was loading too slowly, or mm -hmm. B, it just wasn't clear how to use it. You get, mm -hmm. like all of us get so deep into building our own games that you don't realize what um, a stranger playing a game would actually, how they would actually um, approach it and whether or not they would understand how to play it. Can you, um, I know that Panda Jam is one of your, one of your, Po most popular games, and it's been around for a while now. People keep playing it. Can you take us a little bit through the evolution of that and how you, what you've done to get people still interested? Yeah, so it's a couple different things. Um, a, we launched that on Facebook, iOS, and Android all around the same time. Mm -hmm. So we saw a lot of great pollination between people going from Facebook to either Android or iOS where we're making money on all the different platforms. So that was a big, um, big move for us. Um, secondly, you know, again, we look at stats on a daily basis. And I don't want to talk about um, statistics and analytics too much because you know, your ticket into the game is building a really great, fun game with 
amazing graphics, amazing analytics and animations and stories and all of those things. But if you don't have the analytics behind it these days, it's, it's really tough to keep people engaged um, with your game. So, you know, what we do... Do you have do, an example of that? Yeah, so um, Panda Jam is a great example. So, you know, we were looking at where people were leading our game, where they were spending money, and how long they were spending money. And what we found was that, you know, they really loved the game for the first couple weeks, mm -hmm. or maybe first week and a half through, but they were leaving at two particular levels that were too difficult. And then we found that those that were staying around um, weren't spending in the next couple weeks, but then they started spending again, like in the fourth week. So what that all boils down to is having the proper leveling strategy, and meaning you know, some companies like to have levels that go from sort of A to Z, like easy to hard. Then some companies like to have like easy, 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 kind of hard, but you can get through it, then somewhat easy doable, then a little bit harder. And that's what we do, but we want to make sure that we're not choking off our users at any particular point in our game so they'll be able to continue to play it. So we just, at that point, went through a re-leveling process where we re-leveled our first 80 levels um, to make it more in touch with um, optimizing the user experience as well as the economy, which at the end of the day um, maximizes our lifetime value of our user and the number of users playing our game. And then how do you... Um how do you bring the creative element into it? I mean, how do you make sure that it's still, it's, it doesn't become all about, too much about analytics? Of course. Um, again, like I don't, you know, some people have said, you know, this industry, the, the gaming industry has become a direct marketing analytics industry, and I just don't believe that at all. I think it's, like a, I don't know if it's a necessary evil. It's kind of interesting sometimes, but the creative piece of it is, again, the absolute ticket into the game. Um, so within a game like Panda Jam, you have to have interesting game playing modes or mm -hmm. obstacles or power-ups or boosters and the animations need to be fun and the narrative can, needs to continue to evolve. So all of those things in any game, um, depending on the game, are, are extremely important um, for longe longevity of your user base. Mm -hmm. If we could um, switch to, to monetization, um, you've talked I think a bit about the, about the balance there as well, the advertising versus um, the in-app purchases, and, and, and can you talk a little bit about that and your thinking? Yeah, um, I think our company is a little bit different in that we do have an advertising business. It's maybe 30% of our revenues, and a lot of that's because we acquired a company that was monetizing um, games primarily through advertising, so we had an infrastructure for that, and we decided to continue to grow that business. Um, so we had some diversification among our revenue streams. Um, and if you look at it, at the end of the day, at least for us, and it may not be that way for everyone, but um, about 2% of our entire user base actually buys virtual goods, which is where all of our revenues come from. So you're looking at this 98% of the user base that are essentially playing your game for free. And it's not unreasonable um, if you do it in a um, smart manner that doesn't bother the users to monetize those 98% of the users uh, through advertising. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, we're still kind of trying to play with the right so time what's, frames. So what's the smart way? Yeah, well, what we do is um, we limit the number of ads per session and we wait a couple weeks so the user will play a game for approximately two weeks uh, before they'll see any ads. But if we have a user that's been on on the system for, for months and they've never bought anything, for them to see an occasional interstitial ad um, doesn't seem to be a big deal at all. And um, it's great because you don't have to pay that extra 30% to Apple or Facebook. So it's 100% margin, uh, which is great. What, um, what percentage of your users are usually will buy something, can you say? Yeah, so it's like 2%. Oh, wow. And so, again, when you're looking at metrics on a daily basis, if you can get that 2% to 4%, mm -hmm. um, when we look at our analytics, we have different KPIs that we look at every day. And if they're not um, hitting our, our number, we have prescriptive methods um, to increase those KPIs. And at the end of the day, when you increase the KPIs, or key performance indicators or metrics, however mm -hmm. numbers, um, however we want to kind of dummy that down, you 
increase the amount of money you make per user, which does two things for you. Either A, it increases your margins, which you make more money and you can hire more people, or you can make more games, or B, you can go out and spend more money on advertising to bring in more users. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. What's your biggest challenge right now? Wow, that is a great question. I think it's, um, you know, it's always a big question. It's staffing up with great, amazing, creative, talented people that are so passionate about that game that that passion bleeds into the product and they just intuitively get it. And building teams that all work together that are on that same level. And, you know, for us, it's, you know, that's the most valuable um, thing that you can do because if you hire one person at a time, you know, chances are you're going to be running into some, you know, creative conflicts along the way. And it takes a long time to just create one team. So we have amazing, you know, infrastructure, um, advertising buying, media buying, marketing, analytics. And um, we are growing our game development capacity as quickly as possible. Mm -hmm. So we're doing that through acquisition right now primarily. Um, we're going out looking for the greatest game development teams that are out there that want to be part of something bigger and that have already worked together as a team and have proven themselves and shown that they can, um, that they're so passionate about their products that you can actually see that passion in mm -hmm. their products. Mm -hmm. and, and so that's how we're doing it. But finding the right companies, and we've looked at hundreds of companies, and we just made an acquisition that we announced about a month ago, but yeah. it's not easy to either develop um, great teams internally or find the one, right ones to acquire and to maintain the corp corporate culture as you make acquisitions. Right, right. So you, um, when we were talking earlier, you were talking about some of the learnings from MySpace and how uh, one of the things you realized was the need to focus and how at MySpace you had maybe spread your wings out a little bit too much. Um, can you, so how do you apply that learning into this and make sure as you're acquiring companies and, and growing the business you're not doing it too fast? Yeah, for me, that's the most important key. So I'm very proud of what we did at MySpace. We were the highest trafficked site in the US. And when I left, we were bigger than Facebook in the US. But I can say that I made a lot of mistakes. Um, one of those was getting away from sort of the key social, and I'm going to bring this back to our games, what I'm doing in a second. But one of those mistakes was like, Let's build an email service. OK, hire 15 guys and hire the product manager from Hotmail. Just go do it. Um, why aren't we bigger than Craigslist? Why don't we have a classified service? OK, get 10 guys and go do it. And I have eight more examples. So what we did is we just threw bodies instead of time and thought about you know, what is our core product and how can we make it the best? Mm -hmm. and I think we took our eye at the ball at times um, at MySpace where we had 1,600 employees. I hired way too many people too quickly. And again, the latter people we hired just didn't have that passion or DNA that really understood the product. And at SGN, what we're doing is, again, we're committing our focus to two different areas, like casino and puzzle games with a really strong narrative and amazing art and, and animation behind them. So, we have the knowledge and the passion and people that love building those kinds of games. And so we're getting really good at it. Mm -hmm. And so um, in addition to that, you know, when I talk about cross-platform, some people don't really know what that means. It's an overused term. But essentially what it means to us, and it's incredibly important, is that we develop a game once and then instantly move that game to Facebook, iOS, and Android. You have your own technology that does yes. that, right? And, you know, again, if you look at Zynga, which, you know, has done some great things, that was their big downfall, that they're making all their revenues from Facebook, and they didn't have the technology or the, um, the strategy to be able to quickly move their games to, to every platform. So, again, focusing on technology to solve problems in, instead of having 18 different <coughs> development teams to develop a game differently for um, every platform. We accomplish that through technology. 
and we're only focusing on two different genres. So we hope to be the best, if not one of the best, in those genres. Do you, is that, that's a proprietary technology? Yes. It is. It's like mixed with some other okay. um, off-the-shelf technologies. But yeah, you have to think about all of that up front. You can't just take a game off right. the shelf that someone else has built and run it through our magic machine and, and make it available on every, mm -hmm. on every platform. Does anyone have any questions? It, it's both. I mean, you always have to have remarketing programs, and there's we have different remarketing programs for um, different cohorts of our user base, um, depending on when they left and why they left. Again, it's part of our sort of um, prescription to like when our retention goes down at a certain point. Um, but you know, then you're looking at your one-day retention which is another uh, metric that we look at. And that's primarily for new users. So at that particular level, after we do a re-leveling, we're going to be looking at our one-day retention for that uh, particular level. What's, Does that make sense? Sure. What's the retention rate that you're looking for in that one day? It, you know what? It depends on, on the game. Um, <clears throat> you know, certain games make a lot more money than others. I mean, there's... You know, certain games where you'll have an average uh, lifetime value of four or five dollars. There's other ones that'll be fifty cents, and so it's a mixture between retention and average revenue per daily user, and you swirl those numbers together <laughs> in a really fancy way, and then you get the lifetime right. value of your user, which at the end of the day, um, you're mm -hmm. most interested in. So you tweak one number or the other number. Mm -hmm. um, so again. Um, a one-day retention number, I'm just throwing this out, uh, 45, 50% is, mm -hmm. is decent. Um, mm -hmm. I think anything over 60% is, is quite good. But you know, there's probably some super high monetizing games that are you know, fine with 20, 25% because they make so much money off their users. I mean, Panda Jam's been around for, was it a year? And a year yeah, and well over a year. Okay. How many, of, how many users today were there from the start? That is a good question. Um, in any month, in any given month, um, probably at least a half a million from the start. Really? Wow. Yeah. That's cool. Uh, um, well, building, building on that, do you have analytics or metrics for people that started from the beginning versus they, they cheered off or recycling your user base as far as bringing people back and how you go about doing that? Is it like in incentivization process, like come back or send a notice or something like that, or is that all tracked? Uh, yeah, so each game is instrumented where you know you can identify where each user left the game. Um, and if they were a spender, if they were a non-spender, how many times they tried to solve the level. And I'm just, it's different by game. Um, and then, yeah, you may want to, you could incentivize the user to come back by having different play modes, a different island in a game, um, different obstacles, um, free coins to play in the game, um, free cards, whatever it is. Chris, do you have any predictions on real money gaming, casino games for real money here in the United States? <laughs> It's tough because people talk about real money gaming. And right now, it's really only legal in New Jersey, Nevada, and Delaware. And in Nevada and Delaware, only poker is legal. And they still haven't figured out the regulatory process, like, like who's going to be monitoring those games, who's going to be approving them. And then in New Jersey, they've um, legalized all of the games. But if you look at what that actually means, all that means is if you live in Delaware, you can play poker online in Delaware. That's like 10 people, you know. Um, in, in New Jersey, it's a little bit more interesting. You know, the big dog is obviously California. And it's really unclear what's going to happen in California and how long that whole process is going to take. From my perspective, it's not a big bet that I would make. Um, it's not in our business plan right now. 
uh, it's one of those, um, it would be nice if it happened, and it would be nice if um, it doubled our revenue and doubled our profits, and it was a great business model for us, but it's not something that we're counting on. And I think additionally to that, it's a little bit counter to probably a lot of the people in this room's um, strategy for how they build and operate their games. Um, I don't know about you guys, but we make changes to our games every day, you know, if not every week. And with a casino game, it's really difficult to do that Chris, because I'm it's got to go through a regulation process. And so it's, it's more like making software instead of a game as a service. Thank you, Chris. Uh, we are done. Okay, that went fast. I'm getting the. Thank you, guys. Awesome.